on this Wednesday night, grim projections for Ontario. What the newest COVID-19 modeling predicts? Plus, small businesses struggle to pay rent as help from Ottawa ends. Demanding justice for Joyce Eshaquan. She say herself, you know, weeks before, one day they're gonna kill me. Outrage grows over the callous treatment of the Indigenous woman. Her family says it was part of a pattern. The most unpresidential of debates. There's nothing smart about you. Will you Who shut up, man? Oh, true. Was America the biggest loser? And what was Trump's message to white supremacists? Plus, flipping the script, the Vancouver International Film Festival goes virtual. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. As we say goodbye to September, a month when Canadians got back to school and to work, there are signs this country's biggest province is not getting a grip on the rising cases of COVID-19. In the last 24 hours, 625 more Ontarians tested positive, most of them in the Toronto, Peel and Ottawa regions. It is the seventh day in a row more than 400 new people have been diagnosed. Public health officials say cases in Ontario are now doubling every 10 to 12 days. If that keeps up, they project Ontario could hit 1,000 cases a day by mid-October. Though the bulk of the infections are in younger people, case numbers are now rising in all age groups. And if older people get sick in greater numbers, that could overwhelm Ontario hospitals. They are already urging the government to reimpose tougher restrictions in the hotspot regions before case numbers spiral out of control. Premier Doug Ford says he's not ready to do that yet. Eric Sorensen has our top story. Cracks are emerging in what has been a united front by public health officials to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. A consortium of specialists in Ontario have modelled the future, expecting a rise in cases and, more worryingly, in the need for ICU beds. Last spring, other surgeries were cancelled to accommodate COVID-19 patients. In April and May, close to 300 ICU beds were assigned to COVID-19 patients. The number fell sharply for months, but in recent days has risen to 35. The modelling consensus projects the need will keep rising this fall. If the number stays below 150 ICU beds, hospitals can manage COVID and non-COVID demands. Above 150 in the medium scenario, non-COVID cases become harder to support. Above 350 and the crisis could be worse than in the spring. We are trying to maintain our health care system and in fact uh, bring up our volume on procedures. Uh, much has been discussed about the impact of closing procedures uh, that we did back in the spring. We are trying to not do that. In recent days, Ontario has lowered the limit on private gatherings and tightened restrictions on businesses selling food and alcohol. Some specialists say it's not enough in the face of a new wave of cases. To sit back and watch and see how uh, uh, closing strip clubs and uh, um, capping uh, drinking time in bars uh, to a, to a few hours earlier, see how that does in terms of bending this curve. It's not uh, plausible to me that it will have a significant impact. Meantime, there is a growing backlog in testing at a time when more tests will be needed with children in school and flu season coming. So this has always been about breaking the chains of transmission, always about having aggressive uh, testing capacity and ability, and then ensuring you have appropriate contact tracing to break those trains of those chains of transmission. Ontario's premier suggested it's a difficult balance, keeping Ontarians safe from this persistent coronavirus while also keeping the economy well, yeah, yeah. as healthy as possible. You have to measure, uh, you know, the impacts to the people's livelihoods and so I, t I take the economy very very seriously uh, it's not the same as when we were before we we know a lot more we're better prepared we have the ppes nothing uh, we do is just a quick decision bang do it but the pressure is mounting from some health experts to do just that more targeted lockdowns sooner rather than later eric Sorensen, global news toronto Canada is now consistently reporting more than 1,000 new cases a day. Most of today's new ones are in Ontario and Quebec, Quebec accounting for 838 new cases. Manitoba has 40. Further west, Alberta has 153 new cases and B.C. 125. Small business owners in Canada have their own projection for the coming months, and it looks dire. Not just as revenue down for many businesses, the Federal Commercial Rent Assistance Program expires today. It was a flawed program, but at least it was something. 
The Canadian Federation of Independent Business says 31 percent of its members didn't qualify for the rent assistance program. Either their landlord didn't apply for it or they didn't meet the criteria of a 70 percent reduction in revenue. The government has promised to improve and replace the program, but that hasn't happened yet. And rent is due tomorrow. Mike Drolet explains the anxiety that is causing. A chill has set in on the service industry, and it's not just from the fall weather. Restaurant owners had been banking on a return to normalcy. If we're not operating at 100%, we can't make money. But with COVID-19 numbers on the rise, that's looking unlikely. The 23 Firkin pubs in Ontario have survived, but only barely. Rent relief had been their lifeline, but the government program called Secra has come to an end, leaving tenants on the hook for 100% of their rent. We have to have programs in place to carry us all the way through to the summer of next year. Without that, the industry is going to collapse, not just Firkin. If the government is working on a replacement program, it's not saying, at least not with any specifics. We're aware of that, and I can tell you that uh, we're not going to let them down. A vague promise, which isn't good enough for an industry that's working with very real numbers. The reality is that the math just stops working for restaurants. No matter how hard you work, no matter how innovative you are, if you're a business that operates on 5% margins, but 50% of your business is gone, there's just no way to make that math work. Secra, for all it did, was deeply flawed. It had a budget of $3 billion, yet just over half was dispersed. Business experts say the criteria to qualify were far too narrow. So obviously, I think they need to either change the focus of, of the future program and make it much more easier and simpler for the end user to use it. And the government better announce something soon because rent is due and businesses on the brink have some big decisions to make. Anxiety is, is putting it mildly, I think, for a lot of business owners. Rent is just a huge expense. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. A series of new emergency aid benefits, including expanded eligibility for sick leave, are coming after legislation was passed in Parliament. It's intended to fill the gaps left behind by the CERB, the emergency benefit that's now ended. There was opposition from some MPs to the legislation, but that vanished overnight. And today, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole and Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette were back on Parliament Hill after recovering from COVID-19. As Mike Le Couture reports, it didn't take long for things to get tense. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Aaron O'Toole's first question period as Leader of the Official Opposition started with pleasantries as Prime Minister Justin Trudeau welcomed him back to the House after recovering from COVID-19. Then the gloves came off with O'Toole attacking Trudeau. When are Canadians finally going to receive rapid testing? In response, the Prime Minister pointed out Health Canada has now approved the Abbott ID Now rapid testing system. That comes a day after the government signed a deal to secure 7.9 million of those tests. We can now be deployed to provinces and territories with deliveries coming in the coming weeks, Mr. Speaker. It comes after a late night vote on the government's amended legislation to help workers affected by COVID-19. The Liberals limited debate on the aid, arguing Canadians couldn't wait for the help. But there is concern it lacked proper scrutiny. The fact that we were not invited to do what we were elected for is a problem. Now, the government suddenly made Bill C-4, the pandemic economic package, a confidence vote, essentially to force the hand of all other parties. Voting against it would have caused an election where the Liberals would have been able to blame the opposition and claim they were standing in the way of getting much-needed help to Canadians. Donna? Okay, Mike Le Couture, thanks. Only about 3 million Canadians have downloaded the federal COVID alert app, in part because the technology is not available to everyone. The federal government developed the app, but it's up to the provinces to adopt it. And as Heather Urix West explains, Western provinces are still waiting for changes to be made. Early in the pandemic, Alberta was first out of the gate, launching an app that could help with COVID-19 contact tracing. But there were big problems with Alberta's trace together. Problems now solved in another app developed by the federal government. What I would stress is that this is a very different app. 
and it's one that has wide backing and it's one that's been lauded not just in Canada but internationally as being a really right-headed way of approaching this problem. Problem is the federal COVID alert app is still not available in Alberta. In fact, so far it's only been adopted in Ontario, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador. A senior source with the federal government says the delays boil down to jurisdiction. Ottawa can't impose the app on provincial governments and some provinces don't get feel the app fully meets their needs. I spoke to Minister Haidu, I think it was last week. Um, uh, I'm, I think there were still a couple of issues, uh, still, still a couple of questions that were remaining to be answered. It is an ongoing discussion. Uh, the team uh, with the federal government is working with individual um, provinces at the same, uh, at, uh, sequentially, so we are on that list. But we are also working with them to, uh, to make some adjustments that will meet our needs. But other holdouts are now coming around. Some provinces who weren't really interested in it before, like Quebec, for example, have very really recently said, okay, we're in the middle of the second wave, and suddenly, just in the last few days, something that they were resistant, they've suddenly agreed to start rolling out the app. And Manitoba says it could adopt the app as early as next week. Still, territorial governments say the app wouldn't be well suited for its citizens. Wi-Fi access up north is not widespread. But for the rest of the country, Health Canada says it's hopeful the app will become a widely used weapon in the fight against COVID-19's second wave. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Hospital staff taunted and insulted Joyce Eshaquan in her final hours alive. Coming up, the amplifying demands for answers. The calls for answers are growing louder and the anger is building over how an Indigenous woman was treated in a Quebec hospital. Joyce Echequan recorded video of her last moments alive as staff made racist and callous comments about her. She lay strapped to a bed and was pleading with them to help her. They appeared indifferent and she died a short time later. Echequan, a 37-year-old Indigenous woman, was the mother of seven children ranging in age from seven months to 21 years. Indigenous leaders say her video exposes the realities of systemic racism. As Felicia Perillo reports, three investigations are underway into her death and a warning some viewers may find the video disturbing. 37-year-old Joyce Eshaquan leaves behind her children, a husband, family, friends and an entire community. On Monday, during the last moments of her life, Eshaquan recorded herself pleading for help as nurses mocked her and called her names. <laughs> Family members say Eshaquan was speaking in Atikamit, her mother tongue, saying she was being given too much medication. And that's exactly what family members believe led to her death. We don't need much investigation, said a cousin. We know the facts. We saw the recordings. We saw her condition. Family and friends say this wasn't an isolated incident. According to them, Eshaquan had been treated at the Joliet Hospital before and had experienced racism during past visits. It was like a couple of times that she had experienced and she, she say herself, you know, weeks before, one day they're going to kill me. On Tuesday, Quebec's Premier François Legault announced that a nurse involved in the incident had been fired and that investigations were underway. But the family doesn't think that's good enough. The firing of one nurse doesn't fix anything. There wasn't just one nurse in the video. There were three, he says. It's not just at the individual. Level. Cindy Blackstock, executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, believes the blame goes beyond just the hospital staff involved. So often we look at individual actions and that's where we focus our um, attention on racial discrimination. And that's an important place, but often it's reinforced at the systemic level and even by governments themselves. The Premier denies systemic racism played a role in Eshaquan's death, but Quebec's first Aboriginal surgeon says that is simply untrue. Systemic racism is present here as it is across the country. That's happening throughout Canada, in Toronto, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Montreal, Halifax. So we have to act as a country, as a province, to go against systemic racism. 
The regional health authority denied our request for an interview, but in a statement said there are three levels of investigations underway. They added that internal meetings are taking place to determine if there will be more disciplinary actions against any other staff who were involved. Felicia Perillo, Global News, Joliette, Quebec. Proud boys and the president ahead. Why didn't Trump condemn white supremacists? If you watched the U.S. presidential debate last night, you'll appreciate this. The organizers say they recognize the need for additional structure in the format for the two remaining debates to ensure, they say, a more orderly discussion. Because last night was, well, it's been described by people across the political spectrum as undignified, unpresidential, and a total disaster. Here are a couple of hot takes from U.S. news channels. That is humiliating for us as a country. This was a joke. This sort of debate shouldn't happen in a democracy. I'm just going to say it like it is. That was a shit show. Even the Fox News morning show, which President Trump is known to watch, used a visual aid to coach him for next time. Here's my advice for the president okay. on the next debate. One, interrupt less. There was no winner, and the loser, it seems, was democracy in America. One moment that stood out above the shouting was when President Trump was asked directly if he was willing to condemn white supremacists and militia groups. He was not. Instead, he said they should stand back and stand by. That chilling message is what Jackson Prosco is looking into tonight. I don't know who the Proud Boys are. I mean, you'll have to give me a definition because I really don't know who they are. I can only say they have to stand down, let law enforcement do their work. Suddenly, President Donald Trump claims not to know of the group he directed to stand down. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists? During a debate in which he refused to distance himself from white supremacists and armed militias and instead seemed to send them a message. Then do it, sir. Say it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white right like supremacists. Me to white proud supremacists and right proud proud militias. Boys. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. The Proud Boys Trump mentioned have a history of violent protests. Founded by Canadian Gavin McGuinness, they've been designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Trump's words are already being seen by its members and other white supremacists as a call to action. Getting instructions from the president on a nationally televised platform is a dream of groups like the Proud Boys. It takes on added significance with an election that may be close or even disputed. Both candidates were asked if they would urge their supporters to stay calm. I'm go urging first. my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. Spreading baseless conspiracies about fraud, Trump has called on an army of his voters to serve as poll watchers on election day. In states with open carry laws, some of them could be armed, a potential method of voter intimidation. We don't know the criteria they're using. We just know that they've already been told that there are irregularities um, taking place. And so they're coming in looking for trouble. It's, it's another problem. layer to Trump's long, complicated history with the far right, a group whose support he knows is not up for debate. As for the debate, it's too soon to tell if it moved the needle with undecided voters in any sort of a meaningful way. But early polls do suggest it did not help with already negative views of President Trump. Donna. Okay, Jackson in Washington, thank you. No one's ever gonna keep me down again. Well, if you're a woman of a certain age like me, this Helen Reddy song from 1972 helped shape how you saw your place in the world. Reddy has died at the age of 78. She wrote the lyrics after being belittled and harassed by male executives and performers. It became not just a number one song, but a feminist anthem. I am strong. A Royal Canadian Air Force helicopter is back in the skies after it was roughed up earlier this month in northern Labrador. This is the damage crews woke up to, a huge muddy footprint of a polar bear. The Air Force says no crew members were around during the bear's nighttime visit and the superficial damage was easily repaired. The Vancouver Film Festival was nearly cancelled this year by the pandemic, but organizers have found a way to keep the annual event going. 
As Robin Gill explains, though, stay-at-home cinema is a competitive field. Can you hear me? The curse of Willow's song eerily mirrors the current pandemic. The main character has to spend a lot of time alone, living with uncertainty. Willow. The movie got the attention of the Vancouver International Film Festival and won Best British Columbia Film. It's always a shock, isn't it, when you win anything? Lawyer turned filmmaker Karen Lamb hopes there's an audience beyond the judges because the festival is coming to you in your living room. I did film it for a an actual big screen, so there's a lot of sound design and a lot of details that I wonder how much that translates when it's actually online and on, an, and on a smaller screen. Then there's the competition for eyeballs from other online options like Netflix or Amazon. It's much easier to, to turn something off online than it is to walk out of a cinema, I think. Normally, there would be 300 films at VIF. That's been pared down to 100. A ticket to each film normally costs between 15 to $17 per film, raking in over a million dollars in revenue. Now there's a $60 subscription. So far, 5,000 people have signed up, and close to 6,000 single tickets have sold. There will be a handful of screenings for 50 people max at the newly renovated VIF Center, and that $2.7 million facelift has been a gift. Given the constraints of the pandemic that we were going to be able to have this all completed to the extent that it is. There's still that nostalgia for the way things used to be, but the times, they have changed. And like every other industry, this too has to adjust. It feels like the films that we made were right before the pandemic, and um, it feels like, is this the last film we get to make in this sort of way, you know, before uh, is it going to shift the way that we tell stories? Is it going to shift the way that we film? The answer, probably, yes, who knows. But the one surety for Lamb is that she can take this time to enjoy the praise for her work. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is the sun setting in Belleville, Ontario. We'd love to see your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.